All right, it is March 29th, 2018. I am Hanson Sue, and we are back today with Guido Van Rossum. Hello. So, um, so we're going to uh, pick up where we left off. We were talking about um, Python's change over time. Um, so, sort of going back into that topic, uh, maybe could you describe or summarize how Python has changed over time since, since the beginning to, to now? <coughs> Wow, since the beginning, well, the, the language has expanded. It has many features that I hadn't even th thought of, that, that I wasn't aware you could do with language design, to be honest, in the beginning. It has a much larger library. It has a much larger community. Uh, the philosophy of the language has also changed quite a bit. Uh, I'm pretty flexible. I sort of I like whatever users are doing with the language. Obviously, my original idea was for Python to be sort of in between shell scripts and C programming. Because those uh, sort of in the early '90s, that was the bread and butter of my work my programming work. Uh, and these days, uh, there are many other ways that Python is used where it's either an alternative to Java or Go, or it's a tool all by itself. Uh, scientists use it to drive incredibly powerful libraries. Uh, so, hmm. One, one particular aspect that also has changed quite a bit is how the language is managed and sort of how, the, how changes to the language happen. In the early 90s, everything was basically me. Uh, I think I already mentioned that I was like the mailing list administrator and I reviewed all the patches and I answered all the email questions. Uh, there was also sort of, it was very easy for people to get new things into the language. If they had an idea and I liked the idea, it was basically in. Uh, and we didn't care that much about backwards compatibility because sort of the user base was small enough that if I changed my mind about some detail of the language or even some big, big, very visible part, that was okay. People would just sort of update their code or write new code. Nowadays, we have backwards compatibility. We have sort of, there's a high bar for proposing new features. Uh, we can't break any existing code. And I know there are billions of lines of Python code in the world that could possibly break if we sort of add a, a new feature even or change something in a very subtle way. And even if all the Python code I have written in my life would never be broken by a particular change, chances are that someone else's code will break if, if we're sort of changing existing behavior. So there mu much more thought goes into that. And it's sort of, it's, it's much more a community process. Many times changes go in, I don't get involved at all. It's other people, you might call them lieutenants, or they're, they're just sort of the, the volunteers uh, who are active as core Python developers who have been around the longest, who often make the call, this is a good idea, this is a bad idea. And then there's a whole sort of cycle of development where sort of even, even a good idea doesn't always get accepted for any number of reasons. And that's sort of, the, but that, that's a long process nowadays. And that was sort of, I think we introduced the idea that there was a formal process in early 2000 when we introduced the Python enhancement proposal process. And so now we have PEPs, 
and they're used for all sorts of things, but the basic use of PEPs is to sort of have a way of getting changes into the language that acknowledges sort of the need to think things through and debate things and have a good motivation and a careful specification. Right. Um, talking about backwards compatibility, um, you know, one of the major breaks in backwards compatibility was Python 3.0. Um, why was it necessary to break compatibility in that instance versus previously? Well, versus why was it necessary? That <coughs> I don't know that it was necessary. It, we we decided to to break compatibility, and this this was a collective decision of the sort of the core developers at the time. The sort of the reasons that led us to to break compatibility had to do with certain types of changes where we didn't have we we, we didn't feel there was a gradual backwards compatible way to introduce those changes and at the same time we really did not want the language to be stuck forever with certain sort of misdesigned features. Mm. Uh, Unicode behavior was probably the, the biggest one uh, and the one that, that sort of would have been the hardest to, to sort of change gradually or in a backwards compatible fashion. Mm. Mm, I see. Um. How, do, how well does Python support um, concurrency or functional programming? Uh, for concurrency, Python's approach is mostly based on operating system threads, uh, which is not a very sort of advanced mechanism. It's more sort of an easily available mechanism. We introduced that, I think, in the early 90s. Uh, we sort of, myself and the, the small, a small number of people actually around me at CWI were learning about threading models on hardware that was available to us at the time. There were sort of some workstations had multiple threading sort of built in, into the operating system. And <coughs> Looking back, I think we were fairly naive. Uh, and so Python, Python's multiple threading is in some sense fake because of the global interpreter lock, the, the, the GIL as it's called. Uh, it effectively means that you can create multiple threads and they correspond to operating system level threads which is, is good because you have sort of, you have all the behaviors and property, uh, properties of OS threads. With one exception, uh, you cannot use multiple CPUs simultaneously. And in the early 90s, multiple CPUs on a single machine was like, oh, that was very fancy, that like, the workstations we actually had, had a single CPU. And maybe for very advanced applications, some hardware vendors could sell you multi multiple CPUs and they were super expensive. And they had worked hard on the operating system support for that. But uh, that was not really the focus of Python because when are you going to use multiple CPUs? At least this was how we, we were thinking at the time. Well, when you have something that is incredibly computationally intensive, well, you're probably not going to write that code in Python in the first place because if, you, if your core for loop is written in Python, it's just going to be slower than when you write it in C. So that kind of parallelism was really not it didn't seem interesting to us at the time. And most of the, the hardware we ever saw and that we expected to be using Python on did not have multiple CPUs. But it did have multiple processes and 
several OS vendors, I think Sun and Silicon Graphics and who knows who else, companies we haven't heard of in 20 years, were sort of adding multiple threading to their operating systems. And we saw that there was a certain advantage uh, even when you can o when when sort of using multiple CPUs was not the point of your program. You could do multiple sort of independent I/O actions. You could like have one thread manage the user interface, and another thread talk to the network, and maybe a third thread talk to a database service. And those kind of use cases for threading we thought were very useful. Also, we were just sort of, we were learning about this and somehow an easy way to learn about all sorts of things was to, to write a Python extension to support that new thing because then it was much easier to play with it. I remember teaching myself how sockets worked in the same way. Uh, so like with so many other things in Python, we didn't want to spend the time to, to sort of, and, and we probably also didn't have the technical finesse, at, to be honest, at the time, to sort of take our existing single-threaded interpreter and make it truly concurrent, make it so that if two threads were updating the same database, data, sorry, dictionary, uh, which is an in-memory data structure in Python, that, that sort of, the, the results would be reasonable and you would never have a crash or a deadlock just due to that. I mean, obviously, if one thread is changing a dictionary and the other thread is looking at it, the other thread may sort of see, may or may not see exactly what the first thread put in. They may have to wait a little bit. That was okay, but we sort of, so we didn't want to add concurrency locks to all of Python's fundamental data structures, most of which, well, in many, many of which are, are completely mutable, like lists and dictionaries. Uh, and a lot of things are built out of those, like regular classes and instances are, and modules are all built out of dictionaries, so they're also fundamentally mutable. Mm -hmm. So we sort of, we came up with this quick hack where there was a lock that sort of was essentially protecting all Python's data structures with the exception of I.O. buffers. And we sort of, because we had control over the actual I.O. operations in Python, we designed a set of macros and we did some work in that area so that if you actually went out to the network and you were blocking for a receive or a send operation to complete, another thread would be able to, uh, to run. Uh, and just to sort of, I guess, to keep it interesting or to follow uh, the most common threading model we found in other languages, we also made it so that if you have had multiple threads that were all sort of just doing CPU operations, the interpreter would just occasionally hop between different threads so that they would all get their share of the single CPU. And this is like, at, at some level, the earliest Unix kernels had a similar threading model where different pieces of, of kernel code sort of were had sort of independent control flows, but there was only one CPU. The, the sort of early versions of Unix didn't have multiple CPU support. And I think in many cases, the threading notion was not exported out of the kernel. Out of the kernel, it was all processes, which is a heavier abstraction. But so we sort of did a similar thing as, as sort of kernels do, which is, when you're waiting for I.O., is a good time to let someone else do some work. And then we had this added thing where we, we sort of said, well, if, if nobody gives up the CPU, we'll just sort of switch 
occasionally for you, and that, that is called preemptive uh, scheduling. And this has, this has always been controversial. It's been very useful. The, the use case I described, like one thread taking care of the UI, another thread taking care of the network, uh, or, for example, 10 threads that are all doing network operations where the network is just sort of slow or you're going out way far on the internet. Uh, you can do a lot of useful work using Python's threading model. It's no good, however, to just speed up a slow computation by adding CPUs, which well, I certainly did not predict that at some point Moore's law would sort of run out, or at least we couldn't just buy computer chips that were twice as fast every few years. We would suddenly, hardware manufacturers were sort of giving us computer chips where there were more multiple cores, and you could sort of execute multiple instructions concurrently if you wrote your software that dealt with that. And that sort of, I'm actually mostly glad that we, we didn't jump on that bandwagon too early. Uh, and for specialized cases like uh, numerical Python, NumPy, uh, the libraries can take care of allowing multiple CPUs to do different uh, work concurrently. But the libraries have to be sort of aware of how Python's internals work and release the gil and things like that. Oh, uh, let's let's move on to talking about um, users of Python. So, uh, initially, who were the key adopters, or what organizations were the key adopters uh. um, when it was gaining acceptance? And so, what and what key adopters helped Python gain acceptance? That's tricky. Uh, Often I had no idea even which organizations people were working for who were contributing to Python. Uh, I think I was quite surprised to find in uh, 1994 that there were people at NIST, uh, the National Institutes for Standards and Technology in uh, Maryland, who were using Python and sort of interested in, in doing things with it that I had absolutely no understanding what sort of, what exactly they were using it for. Uh, I don't know how far that particular project went, but that was, that's an example of sort of research labs in a sense adopting Python or at least trying to do things. In the late 90s, uh, very influential was uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs uh, in Livermore here across the bay, uh, which adopted Python as the standard scripting language to derive their numerical computations, and they were ahead of uh, things like NumPy in a sense. They hosted one of the very early Python workshops. I forget when that was, but it must have been in like around 90, 96 or so. Uh, another place, oh yeah, also now, now I think of who was hosting Python workshops in the late 90s. Uh, uh, USGS, the geological uh, survey, there were people there, again, scientists who were adopting Python for uh, for, to, to, to drive their numerical processing code. And they were not writing numerical algorithms in Python, but they were using the fact that Python was easily extensible. So they would write a small amount of bridge code that sort of linked Python on one hand with their Fortran or C++ or C code on the other hand. Uh, and they found that that was a very effective way to sort of let scientists experiment with their data. And, and sort of that development has, has never stopped really. That, that world has grown bigger and bigger and now we have like a lot of data science happening in Python. What about early corporate use? 
major applications um, that we're uh, <coughs> I think in the, the sort of the early web days, Python was also popular with startups who were developing sort of web applications. Uh, actually, yeah, a core, core developer at the time named Greg Stein worked for a small startup. And they were doing an e-commerce platform. Uh, and he somehow convinced all his colleagues, or maybe he convinced the director of engineering or whatever, he convinced everyone that they should write their code in Python. And using like Python's interfaces to databases, interfaces to the web, standard library that made all these things easy. And basically they could concentrate on the functionality and uh, uh, they, they won in, a, in essence a race to be first to market or at least first to beta. Uh, and then they, a very interesting thing happened. They got acquired by Microsoft and suddenly Microsoft uh, owned and was maintaining a huge bundle of Python code. And this was in the late 90s. Was Yahoo Mail also a Python? Uh, oh, now you mention it. Yes, that was also a big one. I forget if that was late 90s or early 2000s, but it, it might have been early 2000s. Uh, they were definitely uh, sort of very big Python users. Yeah, th thanks for reminding me of that. I had totally forgotten. Uh, and I, I don't know if it was just mail, but Yahoo Mail was sort of the big thing that took off at the time. Um, <coughs> we've, we've previously talked about how um, your, your work with the Python community um, caused you to move to the US. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd like to sort of go back to that and, and, and talk about you know, your career trajectory um, from that point till now. So, so starting, so you moved to the US in, in 1994 um, because, partly because you had gotten this invitation from NIST? Yeah, so I spent, I spent two months about in Maryland uh, as sort of a guest of NIST. Then I went back to CWI, but I basically had a job offer in my pocket. And in uh, the, the first half of 95, I moved back to the, to the US to work for CNRI. That was Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf's company. Uh, I think Vint was already no longer much involved with the, the management. So it was, at, at the time it was, maybe just Bob Kahn's company, but it was Bob and Vince sort of creation, Corporation for National Research Initiatives. And they were very cleverly located at a short drive away from Arlington, uh, where I think DARPA or uh, the NSF had their headquarters. And, and we sort of, CNRI got a lot of funding through those organizations for various very interesting, sometimes uh, internet-related research. And Python was supposed, sort of, two programmers there actually sort of looked at Python and thought that it would be a really good tool for a project that they were sort of tasked with that was part of some research. And they met me at that NIST uh, uh, NIST, NIST also organized a workshop for, uh, for in November, I think, 94, for sort of essentially local Python users. Oh, okay, the first Python workshop. The first Python yeah. workshop. And so these two guys at CNRI came up with the idea that Python would be a good language. They, they sort of, they needed a language that, that had a virtual machine. And there were, at the time, there were different ways of interpreting that word. And sort of an interpreter like, like the JVM, essentially, 
Uh, and so Python has, has a similar concept inside the interpreter. Uh, and they thought that that would be a good sort of kind of technology to use in their, in their research project. And it turned out that that particular idea never really went anywhere. Bob Kahn was, was very proud of it. And uh, I remember going through all the motions uh, with lawyers to, for a patent application. But the, the sort of, the technical idea behind it was, was never, never ended up being all that useful. <coughs> uh, but, but Python sort of grew as a result of that. And start, we st well, CNRI also started using Python for other research projects. So several other projects that were also funded by DARPA or NSF or some other funding source that CNRI uh, had figured out. We're also using Python to write big systems, essentially. And a few of those people also ended up as uh, core Python developers. So what were you specifically working on? Uh, I think I was mostly sort of one of the programmers and architects for, for the code. Uh, the code that was part of this project that Bob Kahn Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so the, there, was, there was a lot of programming. There was also a lot of sort of thinking through the architecture of the whole system because it was, was a very networked kind of application. Uh, yeah, hmm. It was, I, I think it was a funny situation because as far as I know, the project... The, the, it was called Nobots, K-N-O-W-B-O-T. Uh, that project had a manager who was really sort of an engineering manager. They run meetings and do the hiring and firing and make sure that the reporting to upper management is okay, that kind of stuff. Uh, and we had a number of programmers, myself and Barry and Roger, and maybe one or two more actually. And I don't believe that we had like researchers on the staff. And I'm actually very surprised because most of the projects that were happening at CNRI, there was someone in a PI role, prime what is it? Uh, principal and principal uh, investigator or something, yeah. And I think for a different project that we did later after the Nobot funding ran out, uh, I was sort of promoted to PI. But I found that it wasn't really a role I was very compatible with. I think, I think for Nobots, uh, Bob Kahn himself sort of acted as PI. And so, but he sort of, yeah, he was running the whole organization, so we didn't have all that, that much sort of regular intense interaction with him. Although I'd, every once in a while he sort of, he tried to micromanage what we were doing. Um. So you also wrote a DARPA-funded proposal called Computer Programming for Everybody? Um, yes. Yes, that was sort of... In, in some sense, that was driven by the need for funding. Because the Nobot project was not sufficiently successful that uh, sort of... Uh, follow-up funding round was feasible. And so we were trying to find other things that we could do with what we had learned. And by then it was obvious that Python was actually a big hit. It might have been a sleeper hit, but it was sort of, 
it was clear that that sort of work on Python itself uh, was a good use of our time. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to find a way to turn that in, into a research project. And in order to qualify for DARPA funding, I think we went for DARPA funding, in order to qualify, you have to sort of present it as research because they, they won't fund a project that is basically, well, there are a number of existing ideas and we're going to implement that. And maybe we're going to implement it slightly differently than before, but the sort of implementation work or like improving a programming language was rarely a fundable thing. But so what we found was that Python had, had interesting sort of prospects for education. And I sort of, I had this vision of people, sort of kids learning, learning Python in school, which at the time looked pretty far-fetched because there weren't even that many computers in most schools. But that's sort of where the computer programming for everybody idea project proposal came from. I'm also pretty sure that it wasn't just me, but that sort of other people in the Python community and there were like workshops every year and, and sort of other times that some people got together. There was some talk about that where people said, oh, Python is such a cool language. It's so simple to learn. Why couldn't we use that in education? Uh, there are people who are currently uh, teaching C++ or Pascal, and C++ is way too complicated for all but like a very small number of brilliant high schoolers. Uh, and Pascal does not really have much of a future as a technical skill, so you can say, well, we're not teaching them programming for, so that they have an employable skill, but we teach them programming so that they learn a certain way of thinking and they know what's going on inside a computer. And sure, but nevertheless, maybe sort of if you teach them Python instead of Pascal, you can sort of, they can focus more on, on that learning experience and less on where the semicolons do or don't go. And that was sort of, it was, it turned out for me personally, it was a very frustrating experience. Uh, I felt like I wasn't very competent in writing a research proposal because I had sort of, I, even though I had worked at the periphery of academia, I'd always been in a programming role, not in a PI role. Uh, I had not written a PhD thesis. I had never really published a paper or cared much about citation indexes or even how to format your references for that matter. And so I, I felt that was, was not, I, I, I wouldn't say I was pulled into it kicking and screaming, but I sort of, I was pretty skeptical about how that would work out. And as it turned out that sort of with a lot of help, we got a small amount of funding enough to sort of keep the team together. Uh, and then it turned out that I had completely misunderstood how research funding actually works. And only after we, we had sort of, we thought we had gotten the grant, it was explained to me, well, okay, now you have to do more talking to people and writing proposals and convincing them that, that they should actually give you money, plus the money you've, you've been allocated is, is not enough. You have to sort of try to get more money, but even the, the sort of the funds that you've been allocated, it came from DARPA, which means that there had to be some defense organization that was doing its own research that thought they 
were interested in our potential results and wanted to fund us. And there was a whole separate sort of set of negotiations, meetings with people from the West Coast who live, worked for some lab in San Diego, I believe, naval research, if I remember correctly. So that was a sort of a big downer because I, I hadn't expected that I had to go to cocktail parties and chat up uh, top researchers who uh, had their names in all the CACM publications and, and things like that. And I, uh, plus I had to sort of manage a team which also turned out the sort of the engineering manager side of that I didn't really enjoy that much. Uh, and then on top of all that, so that, that was sort of, I, was, I don't think I was super happy with that. On the other hand, I was very happy because we, we did actually have continued employment and we didn't have to work on the Nobots. We could spend sort of all our time on doing stuff with Python, which we thought was the most fun. And which sort of had the, the most the rewards because Whenever we release a new version of Python, users would sort of fall over us and say, oh, this is so great, this is amazing. Uh, sort of, there's, there's a really positive feedback loop there. So the team was, was very happy in that sense. And then uh, another dark cloud started looming on the horizon and, and coming closer very quickly, which was licensing issues. Because by the end, it's sort of, I started at CNRI in 95. And so through 99 or so, uh, we did regular releases of Python. And every once in a while, we bumped the, the minor version number. It went from 1.3 to 1.4 to 1.5. And sometimes it was, was the micro version number, 151, 152. Uh, and Bob Kahn started sort of getting uncomfortable with the fact that there was an open source license on there that didn't sort of grant CNRI any rights into the code. Because it was like, well, CNRI has sort of employed all these people and secured the funding for all this work. and. Well, there was, there was mention of CNRI in the license, but the license sort of, it was, it was a very liberal open source license. I think I explained that in the previous session. That was then the MIT license. <coughs> and so Bob Kahn started uh, getting uncomfortable with that. And at the same time, the open source sort of became a thing. Uh, the, the term itself became popular and, and sort of there was the Free Software Foundation on the one side and, side and the Open Source Initiative on the other side and it was like Debian Linux was a very strict open source project and uh, at the same time other projects at CNRI, not, not Python related, uh, had been released under licenses that had been sort of, I don't know, made up by CNRI's lawyers that were very clearly not open source and not free software or Libre software. Uh, and I think that CNRI at the time underestimated the significance of that and thought, well, we'll sort of, there, there was this license for, I think, the digital object identifier system. And there was, a, there was software that was written by, by some people at CNRI that implemented the, all the infrastructure. And the license was essentially not free. It was like, well, if you're just playing around with this or using it strictly for research, you can use it for free and otherwise uh, let's talk and uh, you have to pay for a license. And we were very worried 
uh, that CNRI wanted to change Python's license to a similar non-free, non-open source license. And so CNRI did sort of require us to change the license. Uh, and I felt like I didn't, I, I didn't have sort of legal standing to refuse that because they did fund my time and several other people's time for several years. And surely that sort of amounted to at least some significant fraction of the code that we were releasing regularly. And it was hard to sort of tell where the, the boundaries were, like if a file originated at C CWI in Amsterdam and then was sort of modified or a bug was fixed, fixed in it during my time at CNRI, who owned the copyright to that file, does it really matter? Uh, but there were some worrisome sort of things going, going on. And I remember a very emotional meeting where like the Python team and Bob Kahn and his lawyer and probably some other people really sort of had a big clash about should Python stay open source or should it not? Or sort of can CNRI just change the license? And what are sort of, what are the consequences? I was, I was really scared at that point that Python's, the next version of Python would have a license that was not open source. And that as a result, Python's users would say, oh, we can't touch that. That's, that's, that's sort of commercially too risky because there were, there were like people in, in the Python community who had built their business around Python by then. There was, was a small company named Digital Creations, which later became Zope. Uh, everything they did was Python. They were big contributors to Python as well. Uh, those contributions were sort of not always directly acknowledged in the source code. Uh, and they had thought, well, Python is clearly open source, but that, that license was easy to, to read for a layperson. Uh, and the worry both sort of with me and the Python core team at CNRI, as well as with the user community was that somehow CNRI would suddenly come and say, hey, Digital Creations, or whatever other company, there was, was, was a guy who did computations for pricing for aircraft, like big commercial airliners. Turns out there's a super complicated financial model that determines what the payment schedule is if you buy an, air, an airplane. And he had written all this code in Python, and that was his business. He had, he had like few people worked for him, uh, but he had written all the code. Another example of a really cool application in Python. And the worry was that CNRI would suddenly come and say, hey, you're using this software and we have to, that, that is sort of, that is our property and you have to license it from us. And there's, there was like no reasonable sort of price. I mean, how, what would CNRI be charging if they wanted to charge? Or just the threat that they could come after you with all their lawyers uh, was, was sort of, that worried me a lot. Uh, and fortunately, I think with some intervention by Eric Raymond and uh, Eben Moglen, the Free Software Foundation's lawyer. A compromise was reached where CNRI did put a license on Python that was sort of much longer and worthier and harder to read, but was still sort of approved by the open source initiative 
and by the Free Software Foundation as open source and free software and compatible with the 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 GNU uh, the GPL license, the GNU Public license. So that was pretty scary, and that happened sort of concurrently with a different development, which was, the, I, I think we, we sort of, we were tired of the sort of the DARPA funding story and the threat to the Python license story. And I had been approached by someone who had a startup that was all open source based and he wanted, he desperately wanted to employ me. And I was pretty green where it comes to startups at the time because I had sort of worked for Dutch government funded research organizations and a US research lab that was also essentially government funded even though it was a little less direct. And I had no idea what was going on in the world of venture capitalism and startups. And, and plus we were in Virginia and all the action was happening in California. And I, well, we had some, we had some Python users there, for example, Greg Stein and his team for uh, uh, e-commerce. And we knew that, that there were sort of all sorts of interesting things going on there. And there were conferences. I remember going to uh, early O'Reilly open source conferences. Uh, <clears throat> and so somehow, a little on the late side, actually, I got the startup bug. And I thought, whoa, wouldn't it be cool to be sort of done with this whole CNRI slog and sort of, I could, could just be doing what this guy with his startup says he wants me to do, which is just sort of make Python better. Uh, <clears throat> and so I decided to give that a try. And this was I, be open. Th this was be open. Yeah. And I convinced three of my coworkers at CNRI to also join me. There were a few others who decided to stay at CNRI. They were not so, so into risks. Uh, but myself, Barry, Jeremy, uh, and Fred uh, decided that we would start working for Be Open. Uh, and I remember we sort of we called I I sort of called a meeting with Bob Kahn to talk to him to to basically present him with the news that we were leaving, and he was like in shock. <laughs> he also immediately realized that I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> uh, but he was also he he realized that. He couldn't stop us because we had sort of, without letting him know, we had negotiated contracts and start dates and all sorts of things. And we would just sort of stay in Northern Virginia where we all lived, except for Barry who came from Maryland, but it was just on the other side of the Potomac River. Uh, so Bob saw suddenly four of his most valuable developers depart and sort of one of his projects implode because he, he yeah, I, I have no idea what happened with, with that project. But any, anything we were working on at CNRI that sort of, I don't think any of that continued. Like the NoBot and the- Yeah, and well the, the NoBots were dead by then, but the sort of the computer programming for everybody uh, research was also just us. There, were, there, were, there was another project that was about, uh, I think, nanomachines, or maybe they had a slightly different nan nanotechnology. They stayed. Uh, but anyway, I remember sort of in the following days, Bob Kahn sort of coming to me and sort of 
asking, well, are you sure you know what you're doing? Have you thought about what would, I mean, this is a startup. There must be at least an epsilon probability that it fails. <laughs> and what do you think, would, what is your plan B in that case? I think he also tried to make it clear that we couldn't just come back to CNRI at that point, which <coughs> was completely understandable. And I had never thought I hadn't I had never thought of a plan B, but I I didn't think that going back to CNRI would be a viable plan B. But I definitely had vastly underestimated what the probability was that everything would go uh, upside down. And so as it turned out, I mean, it, it's, it's a crazy story. By the time we started at Be Open, they had already gone through several sort of very dramatic management changes. One of the co-founders had been kicked out due to some unspecified conflict and apparently was paid out his share of, of ownership in cash. <laughs> At least that's, that's, to this day, that's what I believe that happened. He was never heard from again. Uh, and it was sort of, he was paid off. And if, I mean, if he had been paid off in a share of the company, he would have had zero. But as it was, he was probably just happily retired somewhere on the Atlantic coast. But, <clears throat> and so that was one of the big changes that happened, I think, in early 2000. And the other thing was that there was another guy there uh, whose name I can't, can't remember right now, but that was like, it was never really clear what his background was. And he seemed to always sort of claim things that were too good to be true. And he claimed he had an investment company, but he would never go into details. He would never even mention the name of that company. Uh, I remember Someone, I, I, I had a long phone conversation with someone as, as I was sort of trying to get clarity whether I should really join Be Open or not. Uh, and somehow I found another open source developer who knew this person and who basically tried to warn me and saying, this guy fakes it. He's a con man. And he had a particular anecdote where he said, this guy, so this, this was not one of the founders of Be Open. This was, was someone who had sort of attached himself to Be Open in a very early stage as, uh, I think, the CTO. And his, his sort of, his exact title was, was fluid. It was, was very strange, were very strange times. But this guy sort of, so someone, tried to warn me again and said, this guy is not real. And I was just too sort of, Bob Weiner, who was the founder who had most of the connections with me, and who was a, an Emacs core developer, or at least an Emacs, big Emacs contributor. There was a particular Emacs package that he uh, had written that was very well known. and so. I thought he was solid, and he was very convincing. Uh, and he was also vague on details, but uh, my sort of inexperience in these matters made it that I didn't really know what questions to ask or how to sort of critically look at what he was telling me. And so I convinced three of my colleagues to leave our employer, CNRI, I also convinced another core Python developer who uh, was in Cambridge, Massachusetts to move to uh, Reston, Virginia, to also join Be Open. Uh, and Be and Open was headquartered on the 
West Coast or East? The Open was head qu headquartered, I think, in Santa Clara. Hmm. Yeah, we visited their offices once or twice. Uh, but yeah, we 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 were we stayed in Northern Virginia, and we had like weekly meetings in my living room where I had a, one of those fancy speakerphones and we sort of discussed the state of the world with uh, and the company and our work with Bob Weiner. <coughs> uh, and after a few months, Bob Weiner started sort of trying to get us to do other things that didn't look like were part of what he had hired us for before, and we went on recruiting missions, uh, trying to drum up business. I think we went to uh, HP, and I remember uh, the Motley Fool, I believe, we were trying, in they, they, they were a big Python shop, apparently, in 2000. Uh, and we were trying to sell, essentially, sort of, the best Python consulting service uh, money could buy, but nobody would buy because Bob Weiner had sort of, he, he could sort of talk a, a good story, but he didn't have the, the sort of the salesperson skill of closing the deal. That, I mean, well, that's, that's, one thing that that sort of became apparent we 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 saw all these amazing opportunities and nothing ever came of it and he was probably also a terrible judge of character because a lot of the people he hired for senior positions in the company were terrible then he did, i don't think that in 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 the the sort of overheated startup world of Silicon Valley in 99 and 2000, uh, people thought that they sort of should vet people they were trying to employ because there was all so, such, so much competition. If we didn't snatch this great guy, then surely someone else would snatch him. And uh, that was all that matters. And so, like, we had a terrible VP of sales. It was just was pathetic. He was always losing his cell phone and missing appointments. <laughs> we went through, I think, two or three VPs of engineering. And so they were like, every new, new VP of engineering did a complete pivot of what we were going to do at some point. I think the third one said we were going to develop anti-spam software which was a great I, sort of, if you could pull it off, that was great, but w I don't think we had any particular competence in that area. Uh, what and was the company trying to do? Well, yeah, so that was also this really vague thing that <laughs> there was, was like, it was, the core business was supposedly an open source portal website. And so portal website was, was all the rage like Yahoo started out like that. And so there wasn't any search facility or maybe you, you, you could search for one keyword in a small database or something, but it was like, there were supposed to be, there was, was a very fancy homepage with links to all sorts of articles and daily updates. And the hope was that people would sort of visit that website frequently to find out news about open source. And we didn't really understand what it, I mean, the Python team was just cranking out a new Python release, and which we did successfully. <laughs> but uh, sort of the, the, the core be open business was something completely different. And there was a team of web developers and well, we the sort of we never knew who they were or where they were, and they were like the the only contact was through email, and and we never never quite understood who was doing what and why and how and when, and uh, the the website had no, there was basically no no way to make money off that website, and that sort of there was all this this sort of early 
Silicon Valley web startup idea where, well, we'll We'll, we'll, we'll be losing money, but we'll, ma we'll be making it up in volume. That kind of crazy stuff. And like, or, oh, well, first we have to be the most popular open source website, and then we'll figure out how to make money, I guess, advertising. Well, there was like, there was a secret section of the business plan that I'm sure was just made up and didn't make any sense either. And it was something about points. Who knows what that is? So none of, none of sort of the, the company was churning through real money because sort of the Python uh, development team, there was five really well-paid programmers <coughs> and they paid competitive salaries, otherwise we wouldn't have left CNRI. Uh, plus they had the web development team and the hardware for the website and there was no income. So, and it, it was, was clear that that sort of they were getting more and more stressed. And that's, that's sort of when we started going on these, these consulting missions where we were trying to uh, rustle up business and none of it ever worked out. I don't think I wrote a line of anti-spam code or did anything for any of the other co potential customers we had. We cranked out Python 2.0 I forget exactly what the, the timing of that was. I think that was late in the summer and we were sort of hard at work at subsequent things. And we the sort of the only, the only smart thing we did was that we were aggressively open source ourselves. Python was open source and the code was hosted. Well, yeah, one of the things we did was we moved the code from a private CVS server to SourceForge, which also I think at the time didn't have a business model, but wanted to become the big open source uh, service provider for hosting. And so they hosted our uh, revision control, we converted everything. I don't know if that's also when we started a bug tracker, but sort of everything we did was out in the open Lots of people had their own copies because pe anybody could just check it out if they had the Subversion software. Oh yeah, Subversion was written by Greg Stein and a few of his friends. So the same guy, he had sort of reinvented himself. <coughs> anyway, Subversion is now mostly known because it was like, it couldn't make it against the competition of Mercurial and Git. But at the time, Subversion was amazing. It was so much cooler than CVS and it worked and it was fast and it would sort of had lots of cool features. It was very reliable. And so we, we hosted everything on SourceForge in using SVN. Uh, and so when Be Open finally folded, and I, I, I think what happened was that one, one day our paychecks were all sort of reverted. Like there was, everybody had direct deposit and uh, well, every two weeks or twice a month or so, you have your direct deposit in your bank account. And one day someone noticed, hmm, the direct deposit came in and then it was rolled back. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first we heard about it and after that, we got an email from Bob Weiner saying that the company had folded. <laughs> and I think after that, that was on a Friday, and I think the next week we got some, some email or a phone call from uh, one of the investors who was sort of cleaning up loose ends. And uh, I think, I forget where, where we got this advice, but one of, some, somebody who knew about these things said, okay, guys, well, that was that. There's nothing you can get out of Be Open. They don't have a penny. Uh, but there's also no way they can ask for their computers back. So every one of us had like a really nice home computer setup. Like we had big, sort of the beefiest PC you could could buy with big monitor and a fancy keyboard and ethernet cards and modems and uh, I don't know, some kind of zip drive. 
Uh, some, well, everybody got sort of what they wanted. I think some of us had laptops. And the advice we got was, OK, well, just keep your hardware. <laughs> that's, that's sort of your reward for, for so being very suddenly unemployed. And then we started sort of, well, this, this was obviously uh, sort of kind of panicky because we all had families and <laughs> we needed employment. And we, were, we, we ended up negotiating with two small companies that were actually doing real stuff in the Python world. One was ActiveState which I think had become big on doing a Perl port to Windows, but was also branching out to Python and had a lot of interest in, in Python. And the other was Digital Creations, which was just about to rebrand itself as Zope. I think the, the software they had written was called Zope, and there was just a nonsense word they, they had made up. Uh, and Zope was successful, and they were sort of changing the company, which was Digital Creations, into uh, Zope.com. And, well, lucky for us, uh, Zope.com came through, or Digital Creations, I think, at the time still, came through with a competitive offer to take the entire team, and we, we, we oh yeah, we named ourselves Python Labs, that was also the sort of the, the, the internal team name at Be Open. So the five of us were Python Labs. And all of Python Labs stayed together and joined uh, Digital Creations. And we would do sort of part of our time, we would continue cranking out Python releases, and part of our time, uh, we would be working on Zope. And Zope did actually have real customers who are paying the bills. Uh, and I'm very ha happy that we didn't choose Active State because they were in Vancouver, Canada. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, their CEO and founder at the time, uh, oh, dang, I'm blanking out on the name. Uh, <coughs> he was quite a character. <laughs> and Active State has sort of, sort of had I think that the next few years were rough for Active State, although that they're still around and they still have an active Python distribution. It turned out that things at Zoop were also kind of rough, but uh, it was a really nice company to work for, and there was real people and uh, real work, uh, and I had a good, very good time there. It was it was very different from sort of be open, which was basically built on bullshit. And was Zope, where were they located? Uh, oh yeah, that, so Zope was located also in Virginia, in Fredericksburg. Mm. And so we also, we, we lucked out, we continued to basically work from home. And once, maybe twice a week, we would uh, all pile into a car and drive to Fredericksburg on, uh, I think, I-95, which wasn't too bad. And so you spent half your time working on Python itself and then the other half working on um, Zope's own systems. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what, were, what was their primary business? Uh, so Zoop is a web framework. It was very influential in those days in the Python world. It was all written in Python, uh, with the exception of some uh, networking and database layers that were Python extensions. Uh, but they sort of a lot of the the database layer was also open source. And there was like only a little bit of secret sauce. Uh, their main customers were a network of newspapers that uh, mostly in Virginia and uh, other East Coast states, I believe, that had sort of still, a, sort of, they were very much live newspapers, but they also very much wanted the web presence. And they sort of, Zope hosted their websites and uh, wrote 
the applications to run the websites. I think that the, the newspapers themselves just sort of entered the content. And it was not like a modern newspaper website where the entire newspaper is online. It was, I think, mostly classified advertisements and a few other specialized things that sort of were very suitable for putting in computers and accessing online. So then um, you were there until 2003-ish? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and uh, I think by then, Jeremy Hilton had decided that he wanted to move back to Pennsylvania. Uh, so he was part of... He was one of the Python Labs guys. He, mo he left, I think he first uh, moved to Pennsylvania and worked from there, but that didn't work very well. Uh, and then I think he joined Google. Uh, he's still st he's still there. I don't think he did anything in between, and and it had to do with family and his his wife's employment. Uh, so he left, and Soap started sort of having some trouble, sort of getting enough business. Uh, and I got a phone call from a guy who was doing another startup in California. <laughs> Believe it or not. And I had learned, I had learned my lesson. Uh, and I did more research and I sort of, but I did let them convince me to, to join, but not with, not with the whole Python Labs team, they sort of had a very different role for me in mind. So that was a place called Elemental Security, and they were in San Mateo. And the guy, the guy who called me was Dan Farmer, uh, who was uh, sort of an internet celebrity at the time for, or at least in, in a, sort of a hacker idol because he, he knew how to break into any system. But he, he used his powers for good, and he sort of, he had written this together with another guy, I think a Dutch guy, actually. Uh, later, they wrote a book together on uh, forensics, which was really good. Uh, but they had also written software that sort of probed a system's network defenses. And depending on... Uh, your mood, the name of the software was either Satan or Santa. <laughs> and it was, people, people hated that. I think it was just a bunch of Perl scripts that just sort of had a huge data, database of, of known vulnerabilities in, in many different systems. And it would just say sort of, oh yeah, well, if there's something on port 238, try sending it this magic packet, and boom. And and sort of he had so he 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 and Vitze had apparently done this for a long time, and then they had written they had sort of automated the whole thing and released that as open source and they had become somewhat uh, famous and infamous for that obviously. <coughs> uh, and he sort of his idea was to uh, use his skills to uh, <coughs> to sort of increase the defenses of various enterprises. And so from the inside, you could also check for vulnerabilities. Uh, oh, is the mode of the password file maybe world writable? Or uh, is there a user with no password in there? Or things like that. And, and so again, the, the sort of the software <coughs> was intended to to have a, a large and, and constantly updated database of various vulnerabilities, but sort of in a much wider sense than your typical virus checker. It wasn't just looking for files with bad contents, but like a whole system configuration. It turned out that even though they, Dan and his uh, co-founder, who was uh, more of a business person, which 
really sort of helped helped me get over the the fence. But even they couldn't figure out how to sell enterprise software, which turns out is just really hard. You have to sort of you have to have so a lot of enterprise software in order to be able to sell enterprise <laughs> software, and that, that chicken and egg problem, they never uh, got around. So after a few years having fun there, and I, I designed a custom programming language for them and implemented it and did all sorts of other stuff as well. Some mentoring, some rescuing Java code. Uh, <coughs> And when I thought, hmm, yeah, there, there, there was a change in management and uh, I really could not get along with the new VP of engineering and it turned out that several of the other sort of lead engineers also couldn't, so that people were leaving and I thought, okay, well, I'll try something else. And I asked some of my friends at Google, including actually Jeremy Hilton, uh, if uh, I could apply there. So then you started so this, it. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's a lot of sort of very personal history. I don't know how, how much it bears on Python itself. But. Right. Oh, but we're interested in your personal history sure. as well. So, so you started at Google in 2005 and you mm -hmm. were there until 2012. So you could talk about seven years. Period. Yeah, seven years. And your your work on various things there. Uh, <clears throat> well, I always uh, try to do everything with Python and sort of, or in sort of in support of Python developers at Google. So, what were you hired to do? Uh, <clears throat> I was hired my well, at least my first uh, team was actually build tools which is a sort of very internally focused team uh, that at the time owned a variety of developer tools, not just build tools. Uh, actually, the, the thing that got open sourced maybe two years ago under the name Bazel uh, by Google uh, had its origins in in those days, although I had nothing to do with it, but the sort of the people who were, were creating Bazel under the name Blaze at the time were in sort of, we all reported to the same manager. My project, yeah, that it, it wasn't clear what, what I would sort of bring to the table for build tools, although it was clear that I could do something because it was a place where there were a lot of Python applications. Uh, I remember there was a huge wrapper script for Perforce that uh, took care of all sorts of crazy extra stuff that was a huge Python script. Uh, there were Python libraries. And as a starter project, I thought I would do something about the problem of code review. And I wrote one of the very early uh, web-based code review uh, applications. So there's no intelligence in this. Sometimes people seem to think that code review is about finding bugs. That's a different set of tools. Code review is where another engineer can basically check your code and comment on it and tell you, well, OK, you got to change this, this, and this, and then you can check it in. And Google has this and always had, I think, this great system where Every piece of code has to be reviewed by at least one other person before it can be committed to, uh, to source control. And so the, there, was, there were elaborate rules for how to do the reviews, but the tooling for reviews was mostly email. Hmm. And so you had to just handcraft an email or there was a tool that sort of, you, you, I think you could copy and paste the diff into the email and then sort of start typing your comments in the middle of the diff. Uh, and it was all kind of painful. And there were, there were bots that were watching the email and sort of if, if, you, if the reviewer responded with certain phrases, the bot would automatically notify uh, the author of the code, okay, it's been approved and 
then the, the author could commit it. It was always the author who had committed. But the, the, the flow was, was, was complicated because you had to sort of go to your email client to write up the review and to, the, the author had to read the, e the, the review in their email client. But to sort of to see the comments in the context of the code, you had to fire up your editor. And then there was a third tool where you had to fire up, where, where you could sort of see the, the diff highlighted with like deletions in red and additions in green. I think that was about the extent of it. And so there were all these different applications that were involved in doing a review, both the, for the author of the code and for the, the reviewer. And I remember uh, a colleague who was also a, a core Python developer at the time Neil Norwich suggested that as a starter project, I should try to sort of improve that workflow by making a web application for it. And so he sketched maybe some basic ideas like, well, the web application can look at the source code and it can uh, sort of look at your email and it will present the diff in, in, in the web, and then they will write, you, you write a little bit of JavaScript so you can click on uh, any, anywhere in the code and start inserting your, co your comments. And uh, I thought, hmm, okay, well, I've written a web application before. Python seems uh, well supported for this kind of stuff. Uh, so let me try that. And I don't know, it was probably a few months before it was sort of really ready, but it, it became our main project for almost two years. Mm -hmm. And we sort of, we sort of, at the, I think after about a year, every engineer at, at Google was using this tool, which I named Mondrium to do their code reviews. And code review is sort of, is a pretty big part of software development. So I would sort of, if I visited another Google office, I would just walk through the open office space and I'd recognize the color patterns <laughs> of the, the, the review tool I had written on every second screen. That, that was pretty cool. Uh, I think in 2011, they replaced it with a new generation, which was basically the same thing. But I, it, it had a really good run. Uh, and then uh, after it turned, that sort of became too more too much focused on just production, sort of keeping the production up, which was never my strong point. Uh, and <coughs> then I joined the Google App Engine team, which was a completely different thing, but also very Python focused. So that's that sort of. Uh, web hosting of applications written in Python with a database interface that is sort of customized. It's, it's, it's a non-SQL non uh, object database, as, as I think it's called. Mm -hmm. <coughs> NoSQL, I think, is the, is the, the buzzword. Anyway, it's sort of the, it's very different from uh, virtual machines because you don't, you don't get a whole machine, but you get one process that sort of where you can write any Python code you like. And I spent about five years uh, there through all sorts of different <coughs> parts of the project and quite a bit of growth. I mean, when I joined the team, there had just been an internal launch. And so we went through the first public launch. And then a year later, there was another public launch where there were, the second language was supported. So the first language was supported was Python, and then a year later, Java was also supported. Uh, <coughs> but I think the majority of uh, App Engine users always preferred the Python approach. Uh, I, I did all sorts of things uh, there. The, towards the end, I, I also worked on, on attempts to port Py, uh, App Engine to uh, a more traditional virtual machine-based environment, which I think is, is what currently, if you, if you look up Google App Engine, that's usually how it's uh, done. 
and the, the sort of the version I worked on originally was is called classic app engine or something. Um, why was Python so popular, or why is Python so popular at Google? Oh, at Google specifically, I think that uh, Larry and Sergey, uh, when they started coding. Uh, they happened to know some Python and started writing uh, their first prototype in Python, and they had sort of they had some friends help them who were better skilled Python uh, coders, and so there there was always a, a sort of a long tradition of using Python at, at Google, mm -hmm. and sort of by the time I joined in in two thousand five, most most of Google's applications were written in C++, the sort of the search engine and all, all everything around it. Uh, but for internal tooling, uh, whenever there was anything that had to be scripted, it was, almost, it was always Python was the, the sort of lead choice of language. I mean, yeah, I'm sure there was born shell scripting sort of to, to glue a few things together, but that was very, very minimal. And sort of, a lot of tooling was always programmed in Python. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, products would would use Python, but not not all that many. There was uh, for for I don't know maybe four or five years, there was a big project uh, where Google would host open source code. Uh, <coughs> basically, sort of the same idea as GitHub, but using Mercurial. Uh, and the the web presence of that project was all implemented in Python. And during you know this your time at all these various companies, um, mm -hmm. you know, from Be Open to Zope through through Google, you spent half your time continuing to work on Python. Um, th is that was that pretty much continuously? Like you would half of your work was was on Python. That's this yeah. That that's sort of that's pretty much the gist of it. And often, sort of, I think. So where did that start? Well, at, at Be Open, that was basically full time Python, mm -hmm. except during the sort of latter half of the year, there was a lot of pressure to turn that into consulting. Uh, at Zoop. It was pretty much 50-50. Uh, again, maybe towards the end of my stay, uh, there was a bit more pressure to sort of help help out the the projects that were working for for paying customers. Sort of if if the developers there were stuck, or if they urgently needed a certain piece of functionality, uh, the Python lab team would help, and I would sort of dedicate a lot of my time to that. Uh, at Google, I felt that I could just sort of negotiate for what I wanted. Uh, so there I, I just said, well, I would like to have the freedom to spend 50% of my time on pure on Python things whether that's answering email from the community or attending conferences or uh, reviewing peps or coding up new features. And they agree to that. I think elemental security is the one place where I didn't have a deal like that. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, it was a startup, funds were somewhat scarce, although in the beginning it was fairly well funded. Uh, I think I, at, at Elemental, I, I may have had like one day a week or like 20% of my time. Uh, so I was, I was eager to sort of bump that back up to 50%. Because that really sort of, if all I'm doing is using Python, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's obviously my favorite programming language, but I also really crave that sort of interaction with the community and the feeling that, that I'm sort of responsive to, to the needs of the community. Right. 
because you continue to be sort of the, the head of, of the community. Yeah. Um, at, w at what point did the Python Software Foundation get started? The Python Software Foundation started in, I think, 2000 or 2001. Uh, there had actually been some failed attempts at, at having some kind of user organization. Uh, while we were still at CNRI, we actually created something called the Python Software Activity, the PSA. Uh, and this was like in response to some people in the community who said that it would be useful or fun or whatever uh, if people could claim they were a member of, of Python, whatever that means. And maybe that was something that they thought would look good on their resume, or maybe it would sort of help them explain to their manager why this was important. Uh, the PSA was never very successful. I think we had a few hundred members, and I think everyone paid $50. I don't know if it was a, was annually or once, but for when you paid, you just got your name on a mailing list, and there was so there was a separate PSA mailing list, I believe. Uh, <coughs> but we didn't really do anything. There was no like board or bylaws or meetings or minutes or anything. So that was not very successful. I. I don't remember if it was in the B open time, and definitely in the Zope time we had a uh, Python Software Foundation. Yes, it must have been in the Zope time, so it must have been 2001. The Python Software Foundation started, was created in 2001, because I remember sitting down with Zope's lawyer to sort of nail down the details of the bylaws, and the guy explained that it had to be registered in Delaware for some reason. It was like the best corporate law. <coughs> so that's what we did. There was also then at a, a Python conference, uh, we had an official meeting. There was like a group of about 20 founding members. So I was like the I don't know, chairman or something, and several other people. I remember. Well, I think everyone on, in the Python Labs group was was present, and I think Eric Raymond was there, and Greg Stein was there. There's probably minutes somewhere on the Python.org archives. Uh, oh yeah, Dick Hart was there, and that now I remember. Dick Hart was the name of the Active State founder, and so somehow. All of us were like software developers, not very well versed in business and sort of how do you run a foundation. And every time some kind of action item came up, Dick Hart said, oh, I'll do that. Yeah, I got my corporate lawyers. I've got experience. I've been running businesses for years and a nonprofit is not all that different. So all the action items ended up on, on Dick Hart's uh, plate. And then for a whole year, he didn't do anything. <laughs> and then the next year, we had another meeting of the Python Software Foundation board, and nothing had happened. And we essentially started over. <laughs> so what, what was the motivation for starting the foundation at that point in time? Uh, what was the reason that... Yeah, my original motivation was to secure the ownership of the source code. Because after CWI and CNRI and Be Open, I was very worried that at some point I wouldn't make a narrow escape or Python wouldn't make a narrow escape and some part of Python would suddenly be no longer open source and some, some company would sort of claim ownership and say, everybody who's using Python 2.2 or later owes us licensing fees. And there were, there were like horror stories in the industry about that, still are. I mean, uh, the 
Oracle Google lawsuit is essentially about something like that. Mm. <coughs> uh, so there were some examples. Uh, Greg Stein uh, was a member of the Apache Software Foundation. And so he said, well, you, you, you should do it the way we did it in the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, we have pretty simple bylaws. And we basically just copied that. And uh, over the years, some small changes have been made. And the membership sort of structure has changed a few times. But we were essentially pretty happy with that. But the goal was really initially was just have, have a sort of an officially registered organization, a foundation that, that sort of has a legal presence and a claim to the, the source code, copyright, and, and licensing rights. And then the sort of the board will make sure that the PSF always sort of ensures that Python stays open source and that everybody can use it without paying any licensing fees. And it was like, well, sometimes a trademark was an issue. Uh, we wanted to make sure that if pe people sort of started creating software that was also called Python and claiming that they own Python, the name that, that sort of we could say, oh, well, the Python Software Foundation already owns that. And so the only reason that we were, we were collecting money from members and we had sort of the idea was that we had corporate members who would pay like a few thousand dollars annually uh, for the right to be members. And we would just sort of save that money as a rainy day fund in case uh, some kind of legal uh, assault would happen. Uh, <clears throat> and then we got the idea of using those funds as a sort of a starting fund for a conference because we had like workshops that were just essentially run by whichever organization hosted it, like NIST or USGS or LNL. And then for a few years, uh, a conference bureau that was a subsidiary of CNRI ran the conferences. Uh, but they were never able to to sort of make it a commercial success. And people were complaining that despite the lack of commercial success, the entrance fees were too high. And so at a convenient time, I forget if it was 2002 or 2003 thereabouts, uh, we started organizing our own conference. And again, it, as I had way too much involvement with this personally. Uh, through some connection, connections, we found a venue. Uh, and it was a really nice venue. I think it was George Washington University in downtown DC. And it was like three really nice conference rooms. And I learned a lot because it turns out that almost all the money uh, you pay the venue goes to catering. But, and, and so uh, the, the, the sort of, the fact that the PSF was an existing organization made it possible to sort of make the necessary deposits. And we, we, we didn't just have to tell those people, oh, trust us, lot, lots of people like us. We'll pay you back once uh, they've paid their entrance fee. We, we, could, we could sort of, the, the PSF was taking the financial risk for the conference. Uh, and somehow we were smart enough that that was actually successful. And after all the bills were paid, we had a little bit more money in the bank account than before. And we still had like a number of corporate members and, and other sort of occasional uh, random donations. <clears throat> and so we did that again, and, and by now, the PyCon is this gigantic event. Well, gigantic, but there's like 3,000 people show up, and the uh, budget is in the millions. And it's still financially closely tied to the PSF. But except for one year, in I think 2008, it was uh, 
not financially successful, but we also didn't go out of business. And ever before, but also ever since, uh, PyCon has made a modest profit for the BSF. And that has always been used to sort of, well, seed, seed funding for next year's conference, but also sort of just handouts for the Python community. If someone wants to uh, start a local Python event, then the PSF can give them a hundred bucks for pizza or something, or to pay for a local small venue. And so we've, the PSF now, one of its very important roles is to, to sort of foster the community. And there's also sometimes uh, stipends for people who want to attend PyCon uh, but can't afford it, uh, also are paid by PSF funding. And um, moving on to Dropbox, if you've been at Dropbox mm -hmm. since 2013, um, can yeah, you talk about already? Yeah, can you talk <coughs> about what motivated first that move and also what you do there? Well, so my, my move in part was, was motivated by a very personal appeal of Drew Houston, who just came to me and said, look, we've got this great little startup. Uh, <coughs> we are super fans of Python here. That all, all our code is written in Python. Drew and Arash, the two founders, wrote the first client and server for, of Dropbox in Python and all that, all that code is still around and st still mostly uh, written in Python. <coughs> uh, and I think I gave a talk at Dropbox which was like partially for Dropboxers, well there were like 50 employees there at the, like this was like in 2003 or 2004. No, sorry, uh, uh, I mean 2010 or 2011 or so. Uh, I gave a talk there and Drew and I got to talk there again. Uh, I remember him visiting me at, at Google and having lunch and I had a very interesting chat with him about sort of his startup and how they were using Python and I blogged about it. And so <clears throat> at some point, I think in late 2012, he approached me and said, well, you should really consider come, come to work for us. We've got lots of cool stuff. We're big Python fans. Uh, and he was lucky. I mean, I honestly got sort of requests like that before and was never very interested, but the mood in the Google App Engine project had changed quite a bit from the, the sort of the days of the first launches. It was a much larger organization, management was completely different, the project founders had all left Google. Uh, and so I was, was sort of, without actively looking, I was also ready for a new challenge. And I thought, Oh, it's actually pretty cool to see what life is like in a startup with 200 people. Well, by the time I started, it was 250. But sort of, it's always been a lot of fun. And definitely very different things and, and quite a few, and quite, quite a bit of variety of what I've been doing there. Yeah, I started out uh, with also like a starter project that someone suggested, which was a uh, sync for structured data. Uh, this turned out to be not a great, great hit with uh, developers. So that, that, that API is no longer around, but the sort of, it was, was a lot of fun to to sort of create that and work with a whole team of people on sort of getting it ready for production and launching it and presenting it at launch activity. And 
uh, <coughs> we probably worked a little too hard on that particular project. Because <laughs> after, the, after the launch event, everyone was, was like, suffering from burnout and all the developers went on really long vacations <laughs> while the customers were sort of wondering why the software was buggy and why no one was fixing it <laughs> but we we sort of recovered from that uh, my current project uh, which i've been working on pretty much full time for the past two years i think at least uh, is mypy which is a static Type analyzer for Python. Oh. So, yes, it's. I think it, you mentioned something similar last time when we were talking about. There's ABC. probably some overlap. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So it's sort of similar to the, the. Oh wait, this is a static analyzer. It's a static analyzer. Okay. Yeah. So we 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 have a, an optional syntactic extension to Python where you can add type annotations to crit critical parts of the language, mostly function signatures. Uh, and the regular Python interpreter ignores that. But a separate program called MyPy can check those type annotations. And it, it basically analyzes your whole program and uh, checks that whenever you call something the arguments that you provide in the call side correspond to what the, the types of the arguments expected by the function definition. And does this bear any relation to the, the kinds of type checking that ABC had that we were talking about last time? Uh, oh, that is a good question. Let's see. There, there is a certain similarity in that when you don't specify types explicitly in, in Python, the MyPy type checker will infer types based on uh, the values that go into an expression. So the simplest case is if you say x equals 1, then the type of x is an integer. And now if you say y equals x plus 1, then y is also an integer. And there are all sorts of transformations. If you call a function that takes an integer and returns a string, it'll know that it, it'll infer that it's a, a string. And you don't have to sort of declare anything explicitly. There is a difference in that in ABC, there were no type annotations at all. Everything was sort of derived from context uh, and from from sort of literals, and in sort of using MyPy, uh, <coughs> you don't get very far without having to put some, without putting some annotations in. Basically, every function needs to have an annotation. It's just the the variables that don't need to. Um, let's talk a little bit about more your personal life. Um, what are your interests and activities out, outside of Python and outside of work and computing? Well, mostly hanging out with my family, watching TV together. Uh, I like to read books. I like to go out for bike rides. What kind uh, of books? <coughs> uh, well, I like to read uh, sort of popular science, uh, also science fiction, also other novels. Uh, <coughs> yeah, that, that, that varies a lot, <laughs> to be honest. Can you talk a little bit about your family? Uh, I've got a wife and a son. Uh, I got married in 2000, pretty late in life. Uh, we got a kid in 2001. He's 16 now. He's a teenager. He's, uh, he's a good kid. Is your wife American? Uh, she's American, yeah. She's actually from Texas, but we met in the Washington, D.C. area. And... How's your work affected your family life? It affects it a lot. <laughs> yeah, I sort of, 
I really have to force myself to sort of spend time with the family rather than being on the computer always working. Okay, that, like there's, a, there's always more email from Python dev or, or from Dropbox, honestly. Uh, <coughs> so yeah, uh, I'm, I'm the, the main provider. My wife has a PhD in economics. Uh, she used to teach. Then she started a self-defense uh, school in Baltimore. Uh, now she's teaching. Yes, the self-defense stuff is pretty hard on your body, so she can't do that anymore. But she's uh, a personal trainer at the Peninsula Jewish Community Center in Foster City. <coughs> Uh, but so that I'm I'm the breadwinner of the family, and that that sort of that yeah that has affected everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we moved to California because I got a lucrative job here. And in, I mean, are you, are you able to afford to live here with on a single salary? Yeah. Yeah, that's the sort of well that because of my reputation, I I get paid pretty well. Um, what was it like moving to the U.S. from the Netherlands, and what was you know was it a significant adjustment for you? <coughs> well, I guess it was. I mean, I lived in Amsterdam in, uh, in a beautiful apartment on one of the canals. Uh, and I moved to a suburb, Reston in Northern Virginia. Uh, and suddenly I had to drive a car to get everywhere, that kind of stuff. And my social life was very different. Uh, <clears throat> I remember that, that there was a little bit of an adjustment that you couldn't really go out drinking with your buddies uh, and, and get all that drunk because everybody had to drive home <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but all in all, it was, was a a fairly easy transition. I, I was somewhat familiar with life in America, so I had been here on vacation in 86. I had been to numerous conferences in various parts of the country. Uh, <clears throat> I'd seen the Grand Canyon, uh, Yellowstone, Yosemite. Uh, oh, and I, I, I lived in Maryland for two months uh, during that uh, stay at NIST. That also sort of gave me some, some, some experience. Oh yeah, and in 88 or 89, I had spent a summer in Palo Alto uh, working for Dex Cirque. So I, I had actually lived in different parts of the US briefly at least. So I was, was not entirely unfamiliar with all the many differences and the importance of your social security number and the crazy financial system with credit cards and checks. None of that was, was, was all that, that challenging. How would you compare the Netherlands, the Washington DC area and Silicon Valley as places to live and to work? Well, yeah. Uh, <coughs> the Netherlands is actually very densely populated. Uh, Amsterdam is incredibly busy, always was. Uh, where I lived in the DC area was much more like, you know, like suburban. I lived in a townhouse uh, the, the, but was much less dense. 
and you couldn't walk to the corner store to buy your groceries. Uh, <coughs> the weather was very different, uh, much hotter in summer. Uh, winters in Northern Virginia, sometimes uh, there was like two feet of snow. In Amsterdam, if there is like two inches of snow, uh, everybody's excited. <laughs> So yeah, we were talking about comparing um, the Netherlands, D.C., and Silicon Valley. I do remember that that sort of the job offer in California was felt like a great thing. I I really was looking forward to living there, and and I'm still very happy living here. And I think that might have had something to do with uh, the mild weather, but also just with the sort of the cultural and social climate in uh, the Bay Area, especially com compared to DC, which is like, well, it, it <coughs> DC has its has its moments too, definitely, but the sort of it is very much a federal town, mm. and it, the, the, it can be a little dead on, uh, on weekends. Hmm. What about the cultural climate here particularly attracts you? Well, actually I really, I really enjoy the sort of uh, the outdoors things that I can do nearby, like uh, recently, I've, I've uh, picked up birding. Uh, my wife gave me a nice pair of binoculars for my birthday. And like, wherever we go, we have like great shorebirds, raptors. Uh, and I really enjoy those things, bike rides. Uh, the, the weather is good pretty much the year round. Well, I get sort of the funny thing is the longer I live here, the narrower my sort of my my sort of comfort zone seems to get. <laughs> uh, so I'm now now I'm really glad I don't live in D.C. anymore with the hot summers and the frozen winters. Although I actually it, it wasn't so bad, and 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 the Netherlands actually is is relatively mild. It's just never very warm. And I'd sort of, I think of the Netherlands as a lot of outdoors activities too, because it, in part because that's just what my family, when I grew up, enjoyed doing. And there is so much like very flat land where you can see forever and ever and ever. Uh, <coughs> And I just sort of, because I grew up there and, and spent so much time there, that sort of, that's still one of, one of my favorite sort of outdoors landscapes. But I sort of, I, I remember really enjoying the sort of, the mountains of West Virginia, uh, all the different sort of things we, we have here. Uh, my wife grew up in a desert town, El Paso. I've enjoyed that too. I, it's, she's sometimes bored when I say, oh, I'd love to go to the desert because she grew up there. <laughs> but for me, it's very special. All the different types of cacti and stuff. Um. So I sort of have a, a several s sort of more summarizing type of questions. So um, mm -hmm. um, you know, wh who are the, or what organizations, or what are the major users of Python today? I, I, I have to think about the specifically the users, because there, there are so many, but I sort of don't keep a list. I mean, I used to sort of be able to rattle off, well, okay, NASA is using Python, Boeing is using Python, LNL is using Python. Uh, now I'm sure that any name in technology or even in finance that you can mention uh, 
has a large code base in Python. I mean, I, I, I spoke to uh, some investment firm a few years ago, and the, the amount of Python code they have is like unbelievable. It's probably all crap. <laughs> <laughs> like thousands and thousands of programmers writing scripts that uh, that are not really maintainable, but yeah, it's a lot of code. Uh, <coughs> so I, I, I think the, the sort of the areas where Python is used most is on the one hand sort of web application development. Uh, Dropbox is a big one there. Uh, <coughs> tooling, like the, the, the internal tooling we used at, uh, at Google. There's a lot of that in Dropbox too, and sort of, again, Facebook. Instagram, uh, the Instagram service is written in Python. Uh, then there is the sort of numerical Python and scientific Python world, which I don't actually know enough about. Uh, but I know it's, it's a huge growth area for Python. And sort of Python's recent sort of jumping up on all the lists of popular programming languages are largely due to data scientists uh, and, and uh, like Jupyter Notebooks, those kind of things. So that's a very different type of development than sort of what traditionally was one of Python's strength because these people are not developing websites or accessing databases. They're, they're sort of deriving very sophisticated uh, data processing or machine learning libraries. So you were, you were talking about TensorFlow? Sorry. Uh, yeah, TensorFlow is this large machine learning package written by Google. I think they happen to be here today, actually. <coughs> oh yeah, that's right. There was a TensorFlow developers conference. Now I'm I'm sure that all the the sort of essential bits of TensorFlow are implemented in C++ or machine language. Uh, on the other hand, all the users of Tensor, TensorFlow start by writing Python code that imports their data and presents it to TensorFlow. I mean, if you look at sort of tutorials for TensorFlow. Everything just says, start with import TensorFlow. It's not even like, if you're using Python, do it this way. If you're using JavaScript, do it that way. It's just like, here it is. What makes <coughs> Python particularly useful in machine learning applications? It's probably sort of the fact that Python is easily extensible with code written in other languages. So Python is a great glue language. Uh, you can, yes, you can write applications that are millions of lines of Python, but a lot of people uh, write very small Python applications that sort of farm out all the, the heavy lifting to libraries written in other languages. And Python has a very rich environment that makes it possible to link Python with other languages. There are like, you can write a Python extension module very easily. There's a well-developed, well-defined API, well-documented. Uh, there are also tools that sort of write the extensions for you, something called Cython. Uh, <coughs> there are other sort of tools in that area, plus a lot a lot of existing tools for dealing with data and sort of reading data files, like the Pandas uh, project is a good example. And so all these things, the more tools there are that make Python useful in this, this field, uh, the more tools other people will develop to sort of build on that. So it, it's not always necessarily key features of the language, although I think the extensibility is a very important one, but the fact that Python has a convenient for loop or allows a class definitions uh, is probably not all that relevant for the choice of language. <laughs>
to be honest. And um, Python, about 10 years ago, broke into mobile and em embedded computing and, and, also, and since also become popular in Internet of Things. Could you maybe talk about, about that? Mobile is actually still not a great place. There are, there are some projects that uh, do use Python on mobile devices. Uh, but the, the owners of the major mobile platforms aren't all that interested in supporting a wide variety of languages. They prefer to push the one language that they support for that platform and sort of iterate on their envir the environments for that language and the features very quickly because it's, it's, it's a crazy field, to be honest. <coughs> uh, so Python on mobile devices is pretty marginal. Uh, on the other hand, on the Internet of Things, uh, one, thi one thing that, that I think is making a difference is something called MicroPython, which is a really small and lean Python implementation that was written from scratch by someone who sort of had a very different goal than what I had in mind 20 years ago, but uh, who managed to follow Python's sort of syntax exactly. So if it's Python syntax, MicroPython will recognize it and, and work with it. Now, MicroPython's standard library is much, much smaller. And in, I think it's also, in a sense, more varied in that MicroPython can be customized for different hardware. It runs on really small pieces of hardware, and then it also has a really small minimal library. And often, sort of, if there is hardware that has one particular special feature, like it can drive an array of LEDs, then there is a special library that is just dedicated to that platform. There's no sort of pretense at portability there. It's just the, the sort of the core language, not the library. Uh, but I, I think it's a, it's a great piece of work. So why has Python been so successful at so many different things outside of your initial vision for it? <clears throat> well, it, probably the extensibility comes back in there again because it means that, I mean, it's, as a programming language, it's very likable. It's sort of concise. You can sort of, you can show someone, here are the basics of Python, and if they know a bit of programming in another language, they'll see, oh, wow, this is very simple. This is very easy. I can understand this already. Uh, so it's, it's easy to get into, but then in, in every field of endeavor, uh, it turns out that you can adapt Python to do things with, say, the Internet of Things or a particular piece of hardware or tooling or developing websites or driving numerical libraries or driving a user interface. All those things are possible because people wrote extensions. And so Python's extensibility, the sort of the mechanism where you can write some C code, but then it presents to Python programmers as just another module in the world of, of, of Python modules, and that's like a third-party library, that sort of has somehow inspired, like by now, generations of programmers to sort of create new applications using Python. And sort of, it's very easy to turn an application into a library for Python. And so people 
tend to structure their applications as a little bit of top-level code that drives the application and a lot of library code that can be sort of connected to differently by different applications once you're sort of in roughly the same field like visualization. Lots of different people have visualization needs. A visualization library is much more powerful than a visualization application. Uh, the other thing that probably helped a lot is sort of open source which so I'm I'm really glad that we were always successful that sort of the debate over the Python license at the time when I was leaving CNRI and uh, the sort of the PSF to keep keep the ownership of the source code uh, sort of clear and free all those things have helped uh, to to sort of encourage people to do things with Python and that that community has sort of made it where what it is. And where do you think Python will go in the future? Well I obviously hope that it will have a long and successful uh, career in front of us. <coughs> uh, I, I sort of, I actually feel like almost comically in, inadequate in predicting the future. I never know what's going to happen next. So I don't know if the future is the Internet of Things or uh, machine learning or web 3.0 or whatever it is I think Python will will continue to play a big role because of sort of it its flexibility and I I, I expect that Python will also keep evolving to to sort of meet the needs of its users and not just Python the language but Python the sort of the community and the ecosystem will change and, and sort of grow and, and improve and, and learn. And maybe 30 years from now, we won't recognize the community. We will probably still recognize the language because the language as it was 25 years ago is pretty darn similar to what we have now. Um. We want to get a, another take on um, the story of the naming of Python. So um, <laughs> would you just tell that story again on how you named the language? Well, let's see what I remember. Uh, so when, when I started implementing a new language, I don't think I already had a name in mind. Uh, I do remember that I had been very frustrated with the process through which ABC obtained its name uh, because it was like naming by committee. There was like endless submissions of all the team members, what name they thought would be good, and then there was some kind of filtering process, and in the end, none of the sort of cool sounding names were deemed adequate or appropriate or acceptable and something very bland came out. And so I was probably unhappy with the blandness of ABC as a name. Uh, <coughs> I also remember that there sort of There, there, I, I had recognized certain trends in, in naming software systems uh, where at some point, I think my internship at Dex Cirque, uh, they were big on uh, the Greek uh, mythology. And the sort of names, no, names from antiquity were somehow in the 70s and 80s seemed to, 
sort of everybody seemed to name their their big system Olympus or Zeus or <coughs> Hercules or some pun on any of those things. There was there was too much of that. And then there were like languages. Some languages had acronyms or or somewhat pronounceable acronyms like Fortran and Algol. And then there were the names the languages named after sort of important historical figures from science and engineering like Pascal or Eiffel or Ada. Uh, and on the one hand, I thought that that sort of naming it after someone else was kind of cool, but I, I was like, I was not so happy with picking a famous name from, from science, like Euler, or I also wasn't into uh, Lord of the Rings that much, otherwise I might have called it Frodo. <coughs> uh, but I was into somewhat subversive uh, TV shows and so Monty Python was one of those that I enjoyed watching. Uh, and then the, the sort of the name Python has like, it is not complete. I mean, I, I would never name a language Monty Python. I would probably also feel like a copyright infringement or a trademark infringement. Uh, if you name it Python, it could arguably be named after a snake. Uh, I named it after Monty Python, but I sort of I, I I took it from Monty Python, and it was like easy to type, not too many letters, not too many consonants next to each other, easy to pronounce, uh, and it sort of. I don't know, maybe it maybe there was also in some subtle sense where it was similar to Pearl. At least started with a P. I I don't know. Pearl Pearl is a brilliant name because it's a nonsense word and it's it's so pronounceable. Uh but Python felt like a pretty good choice and I didn't want to think about it too too much. I wasn't expecting a major success and so I wasn't really sort of carefully weighing the downsides and upsides of this name versus that. I just went with a gut feeling uh, and uh, oh yeah I should also mention that in the Amoeba project we had named some other tool which I forget after some other TV show, which I also forget. But I, I know that there was definitely at least one other instance, maybe several, where we used sort of current popular culture uh, as our naming inspiration rather than sort of the history of established science or other, other pompous uh, sources of names. And I want to go back to a question for, um, asked earlier today. Um, this will, I guess, be my second to last question. Um, so um, could you talk about Python support for functional programming? <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the, I got into the threading so much that I forgot about the functional programming. That's actually... That's kind of a weird story. Python doesn't have much support for functional programming. And if you sort of, if you look at what the strengths are of functional programming languages, and then, then we're looking at Haskell as like one prime example. Uh, there are a few others like F sharp. <coughs> uh, those languages typically are really strong on the compiler technology. The idea is that uh, 
if you write in a purely functional style and if your language en enforces that you write in a purely functional style, your compiler has a lot of freedom to generate optimal code and when you want to parallelize your code in the compiler, that's easy because the compiler knows sort of what the mathematical properties of your program are. <clears throat> in Python, on the other hand, we, we sort of have adopted a few functional idioms like a map function and a filter function uh, to go with lambdas and we have famously something called comprehensions. Uh, but underneath all those things in Python are very sequential in nature and uh, they do not allow the compiler to rearrange the order of evaluation for different array elements. And that sort of, in, in my view, that actually makes Python fail the test for functional programming support, which is totally fine with me. It's not meant to be a functional language. It's meant to be a procedural object-oriented language. And I sort of, there are certain data types that are immutable and the implementation uh, can use that to, to sort of optimize certain cases. But there are other data structures where I'm much happier with the simple sort of mutable data types that Python has compared to the potential immutable data types that a functional language might have. I'm also pretty sure that a functional language would have a much harder time with uh, sort of an extension module. The, the kind of extensions that are very easy to write in Python uh, are much harder to write for functional languages. And I'm not saying that it's impossible, but you sort of, you have to work much harder at it while in Python it's relatively easy to write extensions. And sort of the, the, the data model that an extension sees is, is pretty straightforward. You know what a list means, it's just an array of object pointers and that helps. So um, yeah, is there anything that you would like to add? Um, sort of talk about anything in general that we missed. Wow, it's uh, we've spent at least five hours talking. Yep. I don't know that we missed much. I I I cannot emphasize enough that uh, the community did it. It's, it's really, I mean, it is such a great place. There are so many people contributing, and yes, we also argue. Uh, <coughs> but the, the sort of, I learned so much from just listening to other people explain why a certain thing cannot work or why we should do a certain other thing, and I enjoy the debate. And I'm very happy that the community takes care of all these things that I couldn't possibly do all by myself, like organizing conferences with 3,000 people or selling t-shirts or even solving the problem of software distribution for Python. There are so many things that sort of are outside my, my, my own scope. I can't possibly sort of solve everything, but I can make the language good enough that other people can solve whatever it is that they need to solve. And so do you, do you see your role as being like providing a, a focal point or a, a figurehead for the community? Like, is that a useful thing for the community to have? Is to have sort of this leader? If I, if I read my fan mail, I 
think that for many people, it's still very important to sort of have a person they can point to. Uh, for the people that, that are doing the actual work, uh, I think my role is mostly that of a mentor. And sort of, I, I, I see myself sort of spending a less and less active role in the development of code and even the development of language features and more sort of helping people sort of figure out how to think about solving software problems and sometimes how to think about solving people problems or community problems or other real world problems. All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs>